Hello everyone, welcome back to another Leak Code video. Today we're going to do a problem 1457, pseudo-palindromic paths in a binary tree. So let's look at the description. Given a binary tree where node values are digits from 1 to 9, a path in the binary tree is said to be pseudo-palindromic if at least one permutation of the node values in the path is a palindrome. Return the number of pseudo-palindromic paths going from the root node to leaf nodes. So in this example, we have three paths, 211, 231, and 233. The only two pseudo-palindromic paths we have are 211 and 233. Therefore, our algorithm should return 2 as its answer. Now, in order to tackle this problem, we have to decompose it into two main parts. And that's what we're going to go over right now. So the first part, I've just reproduced the binary tree here. The first part is actually generating the paths that we have for a given binary tree. And to do this, we can do a simple DFS algorithm, right? DFS just means we start at a source node in some graph. In this case, it's a tree. And we choose a direction to walk in and we walk as deep as we can towards that direction until we reach a bump in the road or until there's nowhere else to go. And then we back up all the way to the beginning and start exploring another direction. That's why we call it depth first in the, instead of breath first, for example. So in this case, we're going to start at, let's say, the node 2 right? Because the source node here is just naturally the root node in our binary tree. And let's say we choose to walk along the right child, right? So we're going to go to node one. Along the way, we have to make sure that we're keeping track of the values we encounter, because those are going to constitute the path that we're going to be analyzing later. So I forgot to mention, when we start at 2, we have to keep track of the fact that we just saw 2. And then we're going to move to 1, and we're going to keep track of 1 as well. And then we're going to move to 1, and we're going to keep track of that as well. So now we have the path to 1, 1. Now DFS is going to go all the way back and start exploring a new direction. It's going to say, okay, now let's go to 3 this time. So now we have 2, 3. And let's say we explore this direction. Now we have two, three, one. And then we're gonna go all the way back and we're gonna start exploring this direction. And in this case, we have two, three, three. So at the end of this algorithm, we have generated through DFS all the root to leaf paths that we can have in this binary tree. That's the first part. The second part is actually trying to understand whether the path we've generated is pseudo-palindromic or not. And as a reminder, pseudo-palindromic means that there is at least one permutation of the node values in this path that turns that path into a palindrome. So, what is a palindrome, and what is an easy way of figuring out whether something is a palindrome? Okay, well, we know that a palindrome is something that can be read the same forward as it can be read backwards. So something like one, two, one. One, two, one, forwards, is the same as one, two, one, backwards. Now, we're not considering whether a path is palindromic. We're considering whether it's pseudo-palindromic. So that means I can rearrange the digits to turn it into a palindrome. That's what pseudo-palindromic means. So we don't have one to one among all the paths that we've generated in this binary tree. We just have something like two, one, one, right? And if you notice, we can actually rearrange the digits here to get one, two, one, which is pretty clearly a palindrome. 
So we can say that the original string is pseudo palindromic. But what would be an algorithm for figuring that out? Well, in order for something to be pseudo palindromic, you have to realize that the frequencies of the digits matter. So that means that the frequencies of all the digits have to be even except for at most one digit. So let's try applying that logic here. The frequency of one is two. That's even. Good. The frequency of two is one. That's odd, but that's fine because so far we've only had one digit that's violated our rule. So we're done looking at all the digits in the string, and so far our condition has passed, meaning that all the frequencies of the digits are even except for at most one. So therefore, we can conclude that this string is pseudo-palindromic. Just to convince you a little more, we can look at something that's not pseudo-palindromic. Let's look at another path, two, three, one. The frequencies of all the digits in this string are odd. That's way too many to satisfy, to satisfy our prerequisites for being pseudo-palindromic. So therefore, we say it is not pseudo-palindromic. Indeed, even if you try to rearrange these digits as much as you want, given all the time in the world, you'll never find an arrangement of these digits that results in a palindrome. So at the end of the day, we, we have an algorithm for determining whether something is pseudo-palindromic. Now we have to make sure that we can perform this check very quickly. And this is the part in the algorithm that is a little tricky and a bit creative at the same time. We're going to use bit manipulation here. So as we're going through this binary tree, we're going to be keeping track of the frequencies of each digit we encounter. So we're going to be keeping a bit string of all zeros. And let's say we are at the beginning of our DFS, we encounter a two. Well, that means that we're going to keep a bit set at position two in our bit string. And we're going to do this by XORing that bit string of all zeros with a one at position two, resulting at one, zero, zero, meaning we saw one occurrence of the digit two. Now, we encounter a one, so we set the first bit, meaning we saw one occurrence of the digit one. Now we see a second one. The thing with XOR is that if you XOR to, to the same, if you XOR the same numbers together, they get completely canceled out. So if you XOR this one with another one, it just becomes a zero. That's just a property of XOR. So that bit string, that path that we've generated to one one is actually just represented by the bit string one zero zero. And this is relying on some bit manipulation, manipulation knowledge, but this means this bit string means that it's a power of two, right? And and that's good because it gives us a way to check for whether a path is pseudo-palindromic. Remember, from before we know that 211 is pseudo-palindromic. And whenever a path is pseudo-palindromic, its representation in bit form is going to be a power of two. So in other words, we reduced our problem of checking whether a path is pseudo-palindromic to checking whether the bit string is a power of two. Now, how do we check whether this is a power of two? We just do an AND operation we and the original bit string with that bit string minus one. The result should be all zeros. If that's true, then we know that our path is pseudo-palindromic. Otherwise, it's not pseudo-palindromic. Let's look at two, three, one, our other path. First, we set the bit at position two for two. Then we set the bit at position three. Then we set the bit at position one. This is the bit string that represents two, three, one we and it with itself and itself minus one, and we don't get all zeros. 
Therefore, it's not pseudopalindromic. Let's look at 233. We have 100, which is what we get after we spotted a 2. And then we set the bit at position 3. And then we see another 3, so that 1 just becomes a 0, right? Because you're XORing two ones together. So at the end, we have 100, which is literally the same thing we saw when we had 211. Now, we already did the math before, and we know that the AND operation is going to result in all zeros. So we know that this path is pseudopalindromic. So at the end, we let's say we keep track of a counter as we're going through all these different paths. And whenever a path is pseudopalindromic, we just increment that counter. So this is the logic for this problem. The really tricky part to wrap your head around is really the bit manipulation. And we do that in order to be as efficient in time and space as possible. So let's go, to the, let's go through the code here. All right, so first we should declare a stack. And this stack is going to contain a single element at first. We're just gonna contain the root and just a variable for keeping track of the path. And we're gonna say, while the stack contains something, we're going to do some logic. So this is DFS boilerplate code. The first thing you do in the traversal is you pop something off the stack, right? And here we're going to have the node and we're going to have the path. And then, right, as we're going through the nodes in the binary tree, we have to set the appropriate bits, right, to keep track of all the digits we've seen so far. So we're going to say path x or equals one left shift by node.val. Again, what that is basically doing is setting the appropriate bit to keep track of the frequencies of each digit. So after we've done that, we move on to checking the neighbors of the node we're at. So first we have to check, let's say we check the left child first, doesn't matter. We have to check if we're stepping onto nothing, right? Because we don't want to put nuns onto our stack. It's worthless to explore those. So only if the left child exists, we're going to continue exploring. And by that, I mean we're going to append items onto the stack, where the first item in the tuple is node.left, and the second item is path. And then we do the same thing for the right child. And we are almost done here, but we have to keep track of what happens when we reach a leaf node. So when we reach a leaf node, that is denoted by the condition where we say if not node.left and not node.right, meaning there doesn't exist a left or right child, then we're at a leaf node and we're gonna have to check whether the binary string we've accumulated so far is a power of two. So that means we're going to do path and path minus one and check if that equals zero. So if that is the case, then we're going to actually increment a counter. So let's imagine that we have a counter variable and I actually forgot to initialize that in the beginning. And that is basically the code. At the end, we just return the counter. So let's just see if it works. Okay, great. So faster than 98% of Python 3 online submissions. So very quickly, the time complexity and the space complexity. So time complexity here is very simple. It's just linear, right? Because at the end of the day, we are just visiting every single node of this tree, right? We're not doing anything more complicated than that. Sure, we're keeping track of bit strings as we go along and we're enumerating all the paths, but that doesn't mean this is necessarily a very time consuming algorithm. At the end of the day, in terms of the input size, which is the number of nodes in the tree, 
we're just visiting every node once. So the space complexity, on the other hand, the, the space complexity depends on the height of the tree. So if we were to look at this binary tree, we notice that as we're doing our depth first search traversal, we're going to be keeping track of a stack. And as we keep track of that stack, we know that the most that stack can grow is going to be bounded by the height of the binary tree. So for example, when we first start the DFS at two, we're gonna append two onto the stack, right? Then we're going to append three and one, right? Then we're going to pop one off, which means we visit this one. And then we're going to append this one because that's the only child of the node we're at. So at any point in time, we know that the stack is not going to exceed the height of this binary tree. So therefore, the space complexity is just big O of h, where h is the height of the binary tree. And that's it. Thank you for watching. And I hope you like, comment, and subscribe if you like this video.